Welcome to Living Word Ministries with our director and Bible teacher, Debbie Blank. Debbie's passion is for you to understand and apply God's truths to your life. Now let's listen and enjoy teaching from the Word of God with Debbie Blank. Now verse 7. We have understanding of why she's destroyed, why this city is going to be destroyed. To the decree that she glorified herself and lived sensuously, to the same degree, <clears throat> give her torment and mourning. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen, and I am not a widow, and will never see mourning. For this reason, in one day, her plagues will come, pestilence and mourning and famine. And she's going to be burned up with fire, for the Lord who judges her is strong. One day. Now, is this a figure of speech also? Or could all of this happen in one day? It could happen in one day. In uh, Isaiah chapter 63, it says, Can a nation be born in one day? And yet that's exactly what ended up happening. Let me read you the passage here. Uh, it says, um, <laughs> that's hard. it's Isaiah 66, uh, verse 8. <clears throat> Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Can a land be born in one day? Can a nation be brought forth all at once? And it happened. Just as God predicted, the nation of Israel came forth in one day, on May 14, 1948, just like God said it would. Now, a lot of stuff went into preparation for that day. But on May 13th, Israel was not a nation, and on May 14th, it was. So, yes, this can happen in one day. We know now all it takes is an atomic bomb, and that will destroy a city in one hour, let alone one day. So it's very possible. We don't know, however, if this is figurative or if it's literal as to the timing, but it is very possible that in one hour her judgment will come. <clears throat> Good point there, and she was talking about earthquakes. All of the Middle East are on fault lines. If you go back to their history, all of Turkey, all of the Middle East, earthquake after earthquake in the early days, and clearly they're going to happen again. And also with all these cataclysmic things that are going to happen, earthquakes are going to be worse than the devastation. We've seen the devastation from the tsunami in Japan. The after effects of earthquakes can be awful. <clears throat> so all of this could be leading up and preparing for that one final day of judgment. Now in verse 9 it says, And the kings of the earth who committed acts of memorality and lived sensuously with her will weep and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance, because of the fear of her torment. And they will say, Whoa, whoa, the great city Babylon. Now, if we had any question, this makes it clear. The great city Babylon. We are talking about a city. The strong city. For in an hour, your judgment has come. Now, this is interesting. I bolded in the PowerPoint because we're going to have three different groups of people that are going to say pretty much the same thing. They're going to stand at a distance. They're going to watch her destruction. They're going to say, whoa, whoa, is the city of Babylon. But they're all people who have committed acts of immorality with her. All people who've been involved in their wealth and their produce with the woman, with the harlot, with the city. <clears throat> and it says here, the kings of the earth. Now in verse 11, it lists different, a different group of people. What group of people is that? The merchants of the earth. They shall weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. And then it goes on for the next several verses to list her cargo. In verse 14 it says... And the fruit you long for has gone from you. And all the things that were luxurious and splendid have passed away from you. And men will no longer find them. The merchants of these things who became rich from her will stand at a distance because of her fear of her torment. Weeping and mourning saying, Whoa, whoa, the great city. She was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearl. In one hour her great wealth has been laid waste. Now it's interesting here because if you count them up you will find 28 commodities of different types of ivory or silver or gold or precious stones, different things that are listed here. And you think, wow, we're getting pretty near the end of the tribulation by the time this is destroyed. I mean, this is it. And with everything that's gone on in the world, there's still all of these precious things available. So there's going to be a lot of destruction, but you know, people are going to be bartering, people are going to be buying and selling, even with everything that's going on, and with all the destruction and all the death of the people, 
There's still going to be wealth. There's still going to be commodities. There's still going to be buying and selling. And I guess we shouldn't be surprised because Jesus says in Matthew 24, it's going to be like in the days of Noah, where people are going to be buying and Amer oh, let's see, let me take you to that verse so I can quote it right. Um, he says in um, Matthew 24, verse 38, Jesus said, For in those days which were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, they were marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And remember in Revelation, we have not yet come to the point where the coming of the Son of Man is here. So he's saying the same thing that happened in Noah's time is going to happen in this time. And that's what we see here in the book of Revelation chapter 18. They're just going about normal life. Now we know from the bowl judgments and the trumpet judgments before them, their normal life, does it include God? Not at all. It includes idolatry. It includes worshiping the Antichrist. It doesn't include God. So it's not normal life like we know it. We've also decided from the scriptures that it's satanic. That is not normal life. The things that are going to happen are not in any way going to be normal. It's going to be the worst hell on earth. But even in the midst of that, there's going to be buying and selling. And the merchants are upset by everything that's going on. Now, the second part of verse 17 tells us that every shipmaster and every passenger and sailor and as many as make their living by the sea stood at a distance. So this is the third group of people now. And they were crying out as they saw the smoke were burning, saying, what city is like the great city? And they threw dust on, her he on their heads. And we're crying out, weeping and mourning, woe, woe to the great city in which all who had ships at the sea became rich by her wealth. For in one hour, she has been laid waste. Same thing, same description. That's what's going to happen. Now, let, let's stop here for a minute and, and ask, what is the great city? In the Bible, when you think of the great city, what city do you think of? Jerusalem. Is this Jerusalem? She says she doesn't think so because it's full of idolatry and evil. That's a good point. There's a major point why this can't be Jerusalem. What? Seaport. That's one major reason. Very good one. Okay, that's it. Jerusalem can't be destroyed. Jesus is going to come here and reign in this city very shortly because we will see it when we get to chapter 19. And he can't reign in a city that's been destroyed. So it's not, those are very good reasons why this cannot be Jerusalem. Is there anything in here that gives us an idea of who the great city is? Babylon is, um, uh, Egypt is the country that's most referred to in the Bible besides Israel. I didn't look to see what city is, but probably Babylon would be, if not the most city besides Jerusalem mentioned, one of the, of the biggest ones. Um, you know, could this be Babylon? The fact of the matter is, up until Saddam Hussein was deposed, he was rebuilding Babylon. And everything that the Bible indicates here, he was trying to attain to in the city of Babylon. And all prophecy nuts 20 years ago were going, oh, see, they're rebuilding Babylon. This is it. This is the answer to prayer. I mean, this is not the prayer. This is the answer to what the Bible says is going to happen. It's Babylon. But once he was deposed, Babylon has not really grown. It's still there, but it really hasn't grown as it did before. Now, could it? Sure could. Sure could. It could be New York City. Clearly, there was no known. At the time John wrote this, uh, Rome was known as the great city. Jerusalem was known as the great city. Babylon was known because of all the problems that Israel had had with Babylon. New York City was not known, but there wasn't any New York City back then. We, really, the text never tells us who it is unless this is literal and it is Babylon. Now, keep in mind, in 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, it's kind of interesting because it says in verse 13, she who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. This is Peter writing. Well, most scholars will tell you that he was talking about Rome then because there was no evidence of a church in Babylon. But, on the other hand, I've read evidence that there was a church in Babylon, and you can see that in Acts chapter 2, at the beginning of the church, when Mesopotamia, people from Mesopotamia, 
were in Jerusalem when the Holy Spirit came upon them. So they would just simply take it back to Babylon. So, you know, people say that Babylon is Rome because of 1 Peter chapter 5. But not necessarily, folks. Let's not get caught up with what people say. Let's get caught up with what Scripture says. All we know is it's a great city. It's going to be a religious center and a political center. It could be Brussels, which is the capital of Europe right now, or the European Union. I mean, that's all we know at this point. It could be any place, but it is a city where the government, uh, not the government, the religious system will be maintained, and the political system also will be maintained there. Yes, people in Babylon do believe it's cursed. So we really don't know from the text. If it's literal, then God's going to rebuild the city of Babylon, and that could happen. We saw Saddam Hussein working on it. It could happen in a matter of no time. If it's not literal, it's referring to a powerful religious and governmental city that could be Istanbul. You know, Istanbul was the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire uh, when it was Constantinople. That's on the sea. It could be that. could be anything. The point is, let's not get worried about what we don't know because this is still a mystery. Let's just focus on what we do know. We do know we have a religious system and we do know it's tied into the city. And the religious system is going to be destroyed and the city is going to be destroyed. And when that happens in verse 20, what, ha what do we see happening after that city is destroyed? It says, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. So, big party. Yeah, I like that. Big party in heaven. Well, does that seem right that they should be rejoicing over people dying? Yes, yes when the people have turned away from God have blatantly, you know, said to God, we don't want anything to do with you and have worshipped another God. You bet it's okay. And this is what they've been waiting for. We've read a couple of times in Revelation when the saints said, how long, oh God, will you wait to avenge our blood? And now he's doing it. He's aven avenging the blood of the saints. And you know what? It's okay. It's right. If you've ever spanked your child, not fun to do, is it? But they need it in order to learn what's right. But if they won't learn, there's consequences down the road that they will have to suffer. These people are suffering the consequences, the, the thumos orge, the fierce wrath of God, because they have turned away from God. They haven't just ignored him. They've chosen to take the mark of the beast and worship another God. And so, of course, there's rejoicing in heaven. I'll be rejoicing with them because I'm, I'm looking forward to the time when God conquers his enemies and he comes to rule. And that's what's going to happen. So it goes on to say in verse 21, And a strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer. There again, it can't be Jerusalem because of that. And the sound of harpists and musicians and so forth and so on will no longer be heard in them, nor brides or grooms, it says in verse 23. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery, your pharmacia, your magic, your witchcraft, your idolatry. Verse 24. And in her was found, again, something we saw in chapter 17, verse 6, the blood of the prophets and the saints and all who've been slain on the earth. Now, in no city, no city on the earth is relegated to the only city where martyrdom has taken place. So, in her, in the city, but also in the religious system, all of the, we see the death of the martyrs. And God has now avenged the blood of the martyrs who have given their lives for Jesus Christ. So, with all of that, we're just about ready for Jesus Christ to return. All the judgments have taken place, and now we get to see the glory in chapter 19. In verse 1, there you have this fabulous picture that some friends gave me that I just love of Jesus coming on a white horse at the glorious return of Jesus Christ that we'll see here in just a few minutes. But before we see that, we see a big party going on in heaven. In verse 1, after these things, there's a time sequence. After we've seen the seal, trumpet, judgments of the bowl judgments take place. After we've understood chapter 17 and 18 about the intricacies of these last judgments. After these things, I heard, as it were, 
a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying what? Hallelujah. What does hallelujah mean? Praise the Lord. Do you know how many times hallelujah is in the New Testament? Four. And they're all in this chapter. They're all in this chapter. You do not see the phrase hallelujah, praise the Lord, anywhere in the New Testament outside of this chapter. Hallelujah, praise the Lord, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Because his judgments are true and righteous. Now this is an important phrase, folks. People aren't rejoicing that people have died. We never want to rejoice in that. They're rejoicing because God's judgments are true and they're righteous. God will only do the right thing in order that sin will be dealt with, in order that the righteousness of God for his hatred of sin will be recognized. He will only do what's true and right. So we have to remember that. And so we're rejoicing at God being recognized, God conquering evil and God being recognized soon as the king. And I say we, right here so far, it just says the great multitude that are in heaven. And then it goes on in verse two and it says, for he has judged the great harlot who is corrupting the earth with their immorality and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. And a second time they said, Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Her smoke rises up. How long? Forever and ever. It's like saying that's it. That's the end of idolatry. At least there, it's the end of idolatry. Verse 4. And then we see two different groups of people. Who are they in verse 4? The 24 elders and four living creatures. When did we see them last? Or I won't say last. When did we see them first? In Revelations 4 and 5, when we saw a description when John was in heaven. And he was standing before the throne of God and he was standing with Jesus. And we saw those 24 elders and the four living creatures. So we see them in heaven along with the great multitude. And they fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne. And they said, Amen and Hallelujah. Amen is so be it. Verily, the end. Hallelujah. It's all been done. It's all done. Now, we've got a little bit more to go that we're going to hear about. But basically, it's done. All the judgments are over, and God, Jesus is going to come reign. Verse 5, and a voice from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bondservants, you who fear him, the small and the great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of whom? A great multitude. We saw them in verse 1. And as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty peals of thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Wow, we're in Revelation chapter 19, verse 6. We've been waiting to read that verse since Genesis 3. Because Satan has been reigning. But now the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Wow, finally, God will set up his kingdom here on earth as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Finally, how patient is our God? 6,000 years, at least. My calculations, which are my calculations, uh, show Adam and Eve being, I think the year uh, 4042 B.C. Might be 4012, I can't remember. Anyway, a little over 4,000 years. And now we're in the year 2013, so you've got, give or take, you know, 4,200, 4,300 years, excuse me, 6,200, 6,300 years that God has been patient, waiting. Because, as I've quoted many times before, it's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of repentance. And he's given everybody a chance. But now we've come to the time when everybody, their decision's been made one way or another. So we move to verse 7, which says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the, what? Marriage of the Lamb has come. Now, where are they right now? We're, they're in heaven. Okay, so the marriage of the Lamb is taking place in heaven. The marriage of the Lamb has come. That's a, 
particular action in the past. So what he's saying here is by this time, the marriage of the Lamb has already been consummated. What's happened in heaven has already consummated the marriage of the Lamb. I'll get to that in a minute. And his bride has made herself ready. Who is the bride of Christ? The church, the believers. Okay, so at this point, before Jesus returns to earth, the believers are already in heaven. They've already gone through the marriage of the Lamb. What is the marriage of the Lamb? Well, you know what? I won't even ask you that. Let's go on and read, and we'll see what it says. And it was given to her, who's the her? The bride, to clothe herself in fine linen. Now, we have throughout this book seen that phrase, fine linen, white and clean, or something, some such thing. We've seen it described of angels. We've seen it described of uh, those overcomers to some of the churches. But now we see it described for the bride, the church of Jesus Christ, the believers. There is no denomination of Jesus Christ. There's an ecclesia, called out ones, who are followers of Jesus Christ. That's the church. It can, it can be a few of every denomination or a whole bunch of all the denominations that believe in Jesus Christ. We don't know. Only God knows our hearts. But it's not a particular church that is the bride of Christ. It's the people who have believed in Jesus Christ. Now, it tells us, that the, it tells us at the end of verse 8 what that fine linen is that we are clothed with. And what is it? The righteous acts of the saints. What does that mean? What are righteous acts of the saints? God is the one who gives us the power. Okay, the righteous acts of the saints are things we do in the power of Jesus Christ for his kingdom. Now, we do a lot of good things for Jesus Christ. I mean, we come to church on Sunday morning, that's a good thing. We might teach Sunday school. We might teach a class like this. We might uh, share the gospel with our friends. But if, if what we do, even if it's a good thing, and even if it's looks like it's for the kingdom of God. If what we do is our own power, there's no reward in that. The reward is when we are empowered by God to do his work for his purpose. And I, I mean, I will honestly tell you in my 35 years of teaching that I have stood up in front of you, not in front of you, I hope, this year, but in the past, I have stood up before under my own power. Because you know what? I didn't have time, or I was mad at God, or I was mad at my husband, or, you know, something was going on, and I had to teach, so I got up and I taught. And I did it in my own power. And I just don't believe... Now, God may have worked in the crowd, even despite my sin, but the fact is, those kinds of things, I don't think there's any reward for it, because that was my own power. Instead, the righteous acts of the saints are the things that we do in God's power for his kingdom. Turn to 2, Chronicle, or 2 Corinthians 5.10. In that passage, it says, and when he's writing to the Corinthians, he's writing to the believers in Corinth, and he says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We all who are believers must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And we will be recompensed for the deeds that we have done in the body, whether they be good or whether they be bad. So when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, recompense means receive rewards. You and I are going to receive rewards at this judgment seat, the Bema seat of Christ, receive rewards for the things that we have done in the body, whether they be good or bad. Now, because it says bad, people think that we're going to be judged for our sins here. That's not what it says. The Hebrew word for good means profitable, something that's beneficial to the kingdom for, through God's spirit. The word bad means something retreating, basically, retreating in battle. It means worthless. So when we do something, like when I'm in the flesh and I'm teaching, it, my reward is worthless because I'm doing it out of my power. God's results may be profitable, but my reward is worthless. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to stand before Jesus and have all my sins brought to light. Wouldn't that be terrible? Wouldn't it just be horrible to stand before Jesus and have him go, okay, Debbie, let's start with your list now. And he pulls out this volume of sins and go one by one in front of all of you. I wouldn't like that too well. But we don't have to worry about that. Why? Because he's already died for our sins. Once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God. 
He's already died for our sins on the cross. He's put our sins as far as the east is from the west. So we don't have to worry about that. When we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, he gives us rewards. He dresses us in fine linen. <clears throat> right here it tells us, fine linen, bright and clean, with those righteous acts that we are being rewarded for, that we have done for his kingdom while on earth. That's what's going to take place right here. This judgment seat of Christ takes place in heaven while the tribulation is going on on earth. Now, whether you believe in the pre-trib rapture or the mid-trib rapture, there's still plenty of time for God to walk us through his judgment of Christ. And it's going to be a judgment of rewards, a glorious time. It's not going to be one of punishment because that sin's already been dealt with. That's us. That's our righteous acts. That's what we're going to be clothed with here in heaven. Assuming, of course, we are in heaven. Now, that's a whole other story that you'll have to come to my prophecy class to talk about where other people go when they die. But for us believers who are in heaven at this point, this is when the judgment seat of Christ takes place. This is when we receive the fine linen for the righteous acts of the saints. And verse 9 says, and he said, there's another event that's going to take place. And he, and he said to me, John, write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then he said, take these, Excuse me. And he said to me, these are true words of God. So you have the marriage of the Lamb. Then you have the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, if you know anything about the Jewish wedding ceremonies in the Old Testament, the marriage and the supper were two different things. Uh, the marriage took place, the consummation of the marriage took place before the supper. And the supper, by the way, was usually... Seven days long. On the seventh day. Yeah, on the seventh day or seven days long, depending. I mean, they kept going. It wasn't just a you know, two-hour reception in the afternoon. It was a long term, usually a seven-day reception of all their friends. So you can equate that with the idea of a millennial kingdom. Okay, now that's important because they went to the groom's house, but the wedding supper was at the bride's house. So where would our house be? On earth. On earth. Thank you for joining us today on Living Word Ministries with Debbie Blank. Living Word Ministries is a listener-supported program. To contact Debbie Blank, you may do so at livingwordministry.org. That's www.livingwordministry.org. Please tune in each week at the same time for Living Word Ministries with Debbie Blank.